Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hi everyone and welcome to Room by Room, the home organisation science insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with expert knowledge from professionals in the field. I'm your host, Gabriella Yastra, coming to you from NAM, Melbourne, Australia. Let's get started. Hi everyone, welcome back to the podcast. I'm here today with Deacon Joe Ferrari, a professor of psychology and St. Vincent de Paul Distinguished Professor. How are you today? Great, thank you for calling me uh, and asking me to do this. I look forward to our chat. Um, so we're gonna talk about your research into clutter and home today. Um, but before we get going, do you wanna just sort of talk about yourself a bit? Um, bit of an introduction? Hmm, okay, let's see. Uh, it's hard for a professor to say a little bit. We like to say a lot. Let's see. I've been at DePaul University, located in Chicago, Illinois, for 28 years. Um, before that, I taught at other schools on the East Coast of the United States, mostly in New York State, small two-year and four-year colleges, public and private. Uh, at DePaul University, um, I am, uh, my research line of, of research is primarily known for now clutter, but before that, chronic procrastination, the causes and the consequences of procrastination. And that might be an exciting topic for us to talk about at another time, because that is in and of itself is a lengthy conversation. It's not a question of time management. Um, there's far more to time to procrastination. But in, I'm trying to remember the year, 2007 or so, there's an organization called the Institute for Challenging Disorganization, ICD. That's the international body of professional declutterers. And they do an annual conference. And about, uh, as I said, 2007, I believe, uh, they invited me to give a talk, the keynote, on procrastination. As I'm talking there, I meet a woman from uh, the University of New Mexico, Dr. Catherine Roster in the business school. And she comes, she goes, she's a consumer psychologist. She looks at possessions and uh, I was looking at procrastination and she said, let's partner and do research. And I said, okay, but I don't want to do it on procrastination. I'd like to look at home. What does home mean to people? we call it psychological home. I'm not talking about the dwelling, the place, but what does it mean? We, we say you eat me out of house and home. Whenever we're together, that's my home. I can't wait to go home. We put people in a nursing home. We travel and we bring things from our house to make that hotel room look like our home. We call people who don't have a house homeless, and that's derogatory. What we should be calling them is uh, is house uh, houseless or uh, unhoused is the politically correct word. But we still say homeless as if somehow they're less than other people because they don't have a house. Uh, that's insulting and that's derogatory because if you know, and I also do research with people who are homeless, uh, homeless houseless, unhoused individuals will tell you, I have a community, I have a group that I'm, I'm with. So I, we were fascinated in looking at clutter and home. And that began the work. So you'll find a lot of articles by Roster and Ferrari. Um, and now some of my graduate students are moving into doing work in this field as well. Uh, so we really pioneered a topic that no one looked at before. Again, from a consumer point of view, and maybe from, I'm a community psychologist, so I'm interested in what impact does a th our behavior have on communities, this sense of bonding that we have with other people. And so we kind of brought our skills together and have been researching this and has been great. And I love working with Dr. Roster. She's just a, Ross is great person. That's a long answer to your question. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, that sounds so interesting. I'll definitely touch on some more of the things that you talked about um, later in the um, interview. But first of off, uh, first off, we want to do a little thing we call Have You Met uh, Deacon Joe Ferrari? Um, so just uh, share like the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear these words could be the most recent or your favorite. Um, so uh, a book that you're reading. I ha I don't have time these days to tell you the truth to read a book uh, between um, readapting teaching uh, conference presentations uh, my daughter getting married my son just got engaged last night uh, yeah, yeah I'm not really reading a book these days congratulations to for you for both your children well I have three kids and the other one got engaged ah. in December for Christmas so oh I've for got all three, three weddings then. coming up one oh, of them that's is so in exciting. June. Uh -huh. Yes, thank you. Um, so do you have time for movies or podcasts as well? Podcasts, I don't listen to. I think they're a time sucker. I don't do TikTok. I don't do Instagram. Uh, Facebook is, I'm an old guy. So Facebook is what my generation uses and that's all I do. And that's why when we talk about procrastination, we'll talk about do we really need all these things or are they wants that have become needs. Um, but movies, uh, my favorite movie and I hope you've heard of it, is called It's a Wonderful Life. It's held every Christmas holiday season. Uh, it's all about how our lives are important. Have you ever heard of It's a Wonderful Life? I have heard of it. I haven't watched it. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, here in the U.S., it must be shown at least a half a dozen times between our, our Thanksgiving and Christmas. I mean, it's, it's on TV all the time. That's certainly one of my favorites. Uh, shows, uh, just saw Dear Evan Hansen. Um, uh, before that come from away, going to see the one who's getting married in June is, is graduating. Uh, and we're going to be visiting her this weekend for her graduation and may go see another show. I think she wants to go see a funny girl that's opening up on Broadway in New York. So, so I do like theater podcasts. I don't do. Mm -hmm. okay, go ahead. Um, do you have a role model that you look up to? A role model? Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess, but I don't know if you really want to talk too much about that as a Catholic deacon, as a clergyman, for me, it's Christ. I look up to Christ. Mm. That's my role model. Uh, good role model, I think. Uh, okay. Hopefully. Um, and is there a course you have completed, um, recently that you really enjoyed? <laughs> no, I'm glad I'm done with that phase of my life years ago. Um, I did go through uh, spiritual direction training. That was probably the most recent thing. That was a couple of years ago to become a spiritual director. Um, yeah, no, that's yeah. about it. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. So we'll get started with the interview now. Um, so you have touched on this a bit already, um, but what is, what is your definition of home? Again, we see home as something more than a physical place. It's not dwelling. Uh, mm -hmm. any, wherever someplace someone feels safe and secure, bonding together. Consider, for example, why it's not a, a, a physical place. Consider the military. I remember early on in our research, uh, some of my, one of my students said, yeah, I grew up in a military family and we were moving around every six years. So home for me isn't a particular city or, or country uh, because we always moved. But I have a sense of home. Uh, so, you know... Um, what, what is home? It's clearly not a physical place. Uh, again, I'm of an older generation, and I still like my landline phone. All right. Now, there was a time in my generation where no matter where you traveled, you could call that number, and you knew someone would be there. That was a sign of home. That was a physical, tangible piece for home for people. Now everyone walks around with their phone. So it's very different. That sense of home is lost. So what is home? Home is this sense. It's not the same as a sense of community, which as community psychologists we look at. That's this sense of bonding with other people and identifying with them. It's not the same as a physical um, physical attachment. There's a body of research on that. When people are attached to physical places and they may have identify, physical uh, identification with a physical place. No, this is something a little different. And so I am being nebulous because the concept is kind of nebulous. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're home, there's that sense, that feeling, that emotion that you get. 
Um, but what, how do we actually define that? Different, uh, difficult, if, if anything else. Mm. Um, I find that um, when I'm on holiday, I always refer to the hotel where I'm staying as home. Uh-huh. Um, and then once, and, but then, you know, when I'm leaving the hotel, I'm like, I'm going home now. Like, I feel like for me, home is something that is both where I s- sleep at night, um, but it's also, I guess, you know, where I, I live full time. Right, um, right. Yeah. It, it's, it's more than that dwelling. That's what I, I mm. want listeners to understand and viewers. That we're not talking about home as, and, and in psychology, fascinating. No one's ever looked at this scientifically. There is philosophers who've talked about it and uh, perhaps other fields, but in the field of psychology as a science, no one's looked at psychological home. Well, there was a one book chapter, there's an Italian article, um, and then there was a conference and that was it. And so what Roster and I have done looking at clutter and home and then looking at home itself um, has really sparked a new interest, I hope. And I like to go into areas of science that people haven't explored procrastination, uh, you know, uh, clutter and look at areas and then move on into those areas. Get people excited by that. And so how does clutter affect the home? That's a good question. Okay. First of all, I think we need to define what is clutter. Okay. Um, When we talk about, we, Dr. Roster and I talk about clutter, we're defining it as uh, an overabundance of possessions that is chaotic and leading to a a disorderly living space. So it's an overabundance. Uh, The question is, well, when is too much too much? That's a good question. But there comes a point where you have too much. It's not the same as hoarding. I want listeners and viewers to understand. Hoarding is, is different than clutter. Hoarding is a psychiatric disorder. Hoarder, um, hoarding has been studied a lot in clinical psychology and in with others. I like to look at the difference as um, clutter is more uh, horizontal, uh, lots of stuff, where hoarding is more vertical, lots of toilet paper, toilet paper, toilet paper, toilet, you know, magazine, 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 magazine. Um, so you have this overabundance of possessions. That's the problem. We live in a culture or Western cultures, at least, that say more, 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 buy, 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 have, have, have. I mean, just think about it. You don't have to leave your home anymore. You can go online, look at it, and we'll bring it to your house. And we won't charge you for that either, right? There are companies that do that. Or you can watch television and just click, oh, I like that. I'll buy that. I'll buy that. Oh, I better hurry up because it's going to go away before a certain time. All right. So all these kind of, we've made it so easy. They've made it so easy for us to have overabundance of possessions. And they tend to be chaotic and it tends to impact your life. Now, I mentioned before ICD, the Institute for Challenging Disorganization, the International Declutterers Group. Well, they notice their title. They see clutter as disorganization. They don't even have clutter in their title. It's called, as I said, disorganization. Uh, the big, three big areas that people have clutter uh, most is in the, the closet, the kitchen, and books. And as we were talking before, I know you have some other podcasts discussing some of those areas, which is perfect, because those are three areas that people have the most clutter. So what a decluttering coach would do, and I know I'm going beyond your initial question, but I hope that's okay. Mm-hmm. That's um, okay. Okay. Uh, What the declutter coach will do is come into your home or office and first have you organize. Don't get a container. Don't start throwing stuff away. Don't start doing that. Let's just organize and realize, wow, you've got 16 spatulas. Boy, 15 pairs of blue pants. Jeez, so many copies of of this one topic uh, in your books. So they get you to organize. And they get the person to look and realize um, that they have so much of these kinds of things. Because let me jump into, um, before I go further on, on how to get rid of all of that, um, when we, Roster and I, measure clutter, all right, we're looking at it in four different domains. Uh, for example, how does it impact the livability of your space? Some people have so much clutter, so many piles, so much stuff that you know they have to navigate walking around their, their house. Does it lead to distress? Does it lead to emotional confrontation? 
I'll talk about in a moment of why people don't declutter and it's tied into those things. How does it impact your relationship with other people? Um, let me jump in here and just give you, there's no significant gender difference in clutter. Sometimes the media likes to say that women have clutter problems or men have clutter problems. There's no significant difference. But, and I think this is interesting, when Rosser and I did our first major study, we had over 1,600 people with a clutter problem fill out our measures and, and, and answer our questions. But only 80 of the 1,600 were men. So I quickly contacted the ICD people and said, oh, is there a gender difference? We have so few men. Is it because clutter is not a man's problem and men don't have one? They said, oh, no, no, no. Men have clutter problems, but men don't seek treatment. Men don't ask for a coach. They view it as their stuff. So returning to the relationship, the impact, you can see how having that, you know, the man doesn't see it as a problem. Uh, the wife, the husband, the partner or might see it as, uh, as an issue, and that causes confrontations and, and difficulties in the relationship. And, of course, the last area or another area we look at is the financial impact. Clutter has lots of impact. Uh, one study was done by somebody that showed a business study that over set, that at least in the U.S., people have over $7,000 worth of unused stuff in their house. These are things they've bought, they've never used. Each there is person? Over, excuse me? Each person has that much? Yes. In each, wow. in each household, you'll have over $7,000. Uh, that, that's... Well, think of why are people's credit cards maxed out? Why are people spending? Well, because they just keep buying, right? And we're in this, in this um, culture that you have to have. You don't have the latest phone? What's the matter with you? Oh, you're behind. You know, uh, why don't you have this? Everybody has this. This will make your life easier. So we're in this, this culture that tells us more and more and more, and you got to have. And if you don't have, well, you're just not good enough. You know, so we have all this. So financially, it drains people. So it all clutter also has impact in terms of that. Um, there was something else I was going to say on that. Oh, yes. Oh, and then a new area of research that we're looking at is digital and electronic uh, waste clutter. Um, and it's been found that, that, again, in the United States at least, there is over $33 billion of used electronics that is out there. And if you think about it, how, and this is rhetorical, don't answer this, but how many old cell phones do you have, smartphones do you have? How many old laptops, computer screens, wires? See, people have a lot of that stuff and they just don't get rid of it. Well, that's e-waste. That's electronic waste that people have. So we're beginning to look at, that's a newer area, but you want to talk about homes and we'll talk about homes mm. that we've been looking at. Are, are you with me? Yes, this yes. Am I talking too yeah. much? No, that's okay. Um, I'm definitely learning a lot. Um, something I wanted to touch on with the with the gender thing. Do you think that? Um, so you're saying that men don't tend to seek treatment, um, but women well, do. Men will see it as their toys, as their stuff. This is my hobby. Uh, women are more so. I mean, that's all. It, that's an interesting dynamic right there. Why? Why does culture? Um, uh, the first word that popped in my head was demonized, but that's not the right word. Why does culture make women feel as if they are, you know, horrible that they have all this stuff, but we don't do that to men? Why? 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 Why, why do we do that? That's rhetorical hmm. too. I don't know. But anyway, go ahead. And then the other, so that was one of my questions. The other question was, do does does the stuff that men collect, does that not impact their functioning oh. in their house oh of course it does of course it does they just don't deal with it it's just okay. it's okay it's all right it's my tools it's my toys it's my stuff it's my collection it's my hobby you know so people have all these different items and uh, the piles that grow up remember for uh, the decluttering coaches it's all a question of or disorganization organize that's what they want you to do first don't throw out organize and when you start organizing then you realize how much you have and if we have time, I'd like to get into the popular but incorrect statement, the touch it and keep it if, it if it gives you joy. That's very incorrect on a number of levels. You may have heard of that quote. I have. Um, yeah. Working in this uh, podcast area, definitely have heard that more than once. Yes. I mean, I, you want me to explain it now? 
<laughs> I mean, yeah, well, go ahead. Okay. You can always uh, edit. Well, yeah. okay. So the, the expression is touch it and keep it if it gives you joy. Well, touch it. Let's let's go there first. I mentioned that I partner with this woman, Catherine Roster. She's a consumer psychologist. That means they look at, at how people buy things and, and the way we market things and, and how to get people to buy your products. All right. For example, when you go to the store, particularly like a supermarket, all right, I don't know if you know, but uh, companies will pay extra money to have their product eye level with customers. So it's not higher or lower because, again, you're more likely to buy it. So research has shown, you know, you want your product eye level. Consumer psychologists say if you go to the store and you touch something, you're more likely to buy it than if you just looked at it. So touching it means I'm going to keep it. The decluttering coaches will say, well, they, they believe you organize. Let's go to the 15 pairs of blue pants I was mentioning. Okay, uh, jumpers. You have 15 pairs. They would tell you, don't go and start throwing them out. You have a friend or the coach hold it up and say, do you need this? Because if you touch it, you're going to keep it. So when someone says, Touch it and see if it, you know, gives you joy. You're already creating the person to keep the item. And now let's look at the word joy. As a psychologist, joy is a very interesting emotion. It's, it's a deep emotion. It's not the same as happiness. And so when that quote first came out, a lot of media reporters contacted me and Dr. Roster. And I remember the one from the New York Times. No, actually, yes, I remember the New York Times. But I remember the Japanese reporter who contacts me and says, so, uh, you know, Dr. Ferrari, Deacon Joe, you're the one who's studying this uh, clutter, uh, and, and, we, and this is a new thing here that people are giving attention to. Uh, what do you think? And I, and I mentioned I, I'm troubled with this expression, touch it if it gives you joy, because joy is, is, is kind of a special emotion. And this Japanese reporter said, yes. The actual translation is happiness. Mm. But it, when you translate it into English, joy is the word that's preferred because joy sells books. Okay. So, um, and, and happiness is momentary. See, that's what I'm trying to say. Mm. Joy is deep. When, during the Christmas holiday season, we sing a song, song, joy to the world. We don't say happiness to the world. Why? Because joy is a much deeper thing. Happiness is fleeting. It's a mood. Mood are short emotions. Um, and so I'm, I'm troubled by that expression, touch it and keep it if it gives you joy, because you shouldn't touch it. And you're only talking about a momentary happiness. So your recommendation is not to touch things, just to get your friend to like hold them up friend or and then throw them away. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And again, yeah. it's not only me saying that. This is what the professionals are saying. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe they're saying that so you hire them. But they're saying, you know, let them be the one to hold up the item and say, do you want this or not? Mm -hmm. And now that you mentioned it, I'm thinking of, I assume you guys uh, see the TV show Hoarders or have seen uh, episodes does that ring a bell? There's a TV show I, called Hoarders. I think I've watched it once. Okay. Um, I actually don't. I purposely don't. That's watch fine. That's fine. But I have seen stuff. it a few times, and when I've mm -hmm. seen it a few times, you notice they don't have the hoarder really touch the stuff. Mm -hmm. The hoarder is often sitting down. Watch it a few more times and see what I'm saying. Or viewers, or listeners, see what I'm saying. That, that person will be sitting down, and they'll have other people touch and sort. So there's a reason for that, rather than have the person. Because a few times the hoarder does get up and starts touching. The, I got to keep this. Oh, I, I can't throw that away. Oh, this is important, you know. So you don't want the person to touch it. Um, so I think that's a good strategy. Uh, I don't know if we're going to get to what what can you do. That's one of mm. the things. Don't touch it. Let somebody else hold it and ask you, do you need it? Okay. Um. Well, while we're on the topic, um, what other suggestions do you have to help um, tackle, um, you know, disorganization and clutter? Sure. So organize yourself and notice how many things. Okay. Why don't, why do, I, I think to answer that question, I've got to get into why is it so hard for people to declutter? 
and I'll give you four different things. Um, and, and in that process, I'll be able to, I hope, address um, how to clutter and those things. Okay, one of the reasons why people don't declutter is because there's often, it's often emotionally stressful. What do I mean by that? Well, the item might be a trigger. Now, it could be a trigger to a positive past. So if I get rid of that thing, the joy that it brought me or the experience that I had with that is going to be lost. I'm afraid. You know, so people buy souvenirs. Use that as an example. And they have these items all over their house. And they don't want to get rid of it because I love that trip. And that was a great family time. And we did this or that. Or I met this person that was important to my life. Da, 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 da. On the other hand, it can also be an emotional trigger for past uh, hurts that happened. Um, and so people don't want to get rid of because I don't want to touch it. I don't want to be reminded. I don't want to see that anymore. You know, Gabriella, we all walk around with wounds. You introduced me as Deacon Joe. Yeah, I'm a Catholic clergyman. And one of the things we talk about in, in clergy, in the ministry world, is that people have wounds, pains uh, that we don't know they have. You know, that's the interesting thing about a wound. You can't see the person's wound. But I might inadvertently, um, not intentionally, touch your wound. And so that trigger of that item might be a touching of their wound, as we would say mm -hmm. in my field. Um, so it's a trigger to the past because it touches their wound. Another reason why people don't declutter is because there may be multiple de uh, decision makers that are involved. It may be it is not only up to me to make the decision. Do we get rid of that table and chairs? Should we get rid of the lamp? Do we really need that couch? Well, maybe there's other people that are involved. And so if I made that unilateral decision, that causes conflict, right? So there, that's another issue, why I can't necessarily get rid of the item. One common uh, uh, comment, uh, uh, can I go on? Does these make sense? Yeah, I had one question. Oh, okay. Um, so I got one more area, but I'll let me answer your okay. question first. What, so what was the first area again? Um, I had a emotionally about stressful. That. It's emotionally stressful. Yeah. So if you have something that is a trigger in your life that makes you feel bad and it's in your house and getting rid of it would make you feel bad, you know, it would, it would um, open up the wound. It might bring back that old memory, might bring but, up the wound. Yeah, bring back the old memory. But having it in your house, wouldn't that continually reopen that wound anyway? No, because it's all, I don't see it. It might be in a spot uh, I don't look at. I don't go there. Mm-hmm buried on the shelf. It's in okay. the closet. It's, uh, we put it in a box. It's away somewhere. It's, it's in the bottom shelf in the kitchen. You know, who knows? All right. Certainly. Yes. If it's always there, that would be a, a problem for the person, but uh, you have to assume that, uh, the reason why they are keeping it there, it's still in the house, you know, 20 years later is because it's not visible. It's in the closet. It's in the attic. It's in the crawl space or wherever the garage. Okay, that, that was my question. So what was the third area you're talking well, about? Well, the other thing is uh, very common. People would say uh, a lack of time. You know, I really would like to declutter, but uh, I just don't have the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have to answer that by a little story. I'm full of stories. That's what professors are, I hope. Okay, so when the pandemic took off, started, Dr. Roster Ross and I uh, decided we want to look at decluttering during COVID. We have several papers on all of that, you know, uh, because one of the things we heard, I heard in the news, I don't know, I assume there too, uh, was that people were decluttering. They were going, they were stuck at home and now they're going into the closets and they're going into those drawers and they're doing all these things, right? Have you heard all that? Does that sound familiar? Uh, I think we had the opposite here. Everyone's buying. <laughs> Ah, uh, well, yeah. here, here in the people were, were shut in and they couldn't go anywhere. So they decided, well, I'm finally going to empty out the garage or clean this out. Well, argh, that's wrong. That didn't happen. It was actually, so we interviewed the decluttering coaches. We brought together a focus group of some of the leaders that are around and we said to them, tell us about what the experience. And they said, one thing we always heard from our clients was lack of time. Now they're home. Now they're shut in. Now they can't go anywhere and they're still not clutter, decluttering. That, that's always been an excuse that people have. Now you might stop and say, wait a minute, Ferrari, you know, um, women uh, who had to stay home had the family to take care of. They had the kids to school. That's true. That's why they didn't have time to declutter. Absolutely. But not all women had kids. 
not all women, you know, had families to take care of. So how do you explain that population? You know, what about those men? All right. So lack of time is one of the excuses that people have. And it's literally an excuse. Lack of resources. Another one, part of this lack. People say, I just don't know where to get rid of it. You know, I really want to get rid of this item, but my family doesn't want it. Oh, this is a common thing. I've given talks um, on clutter. It's, it's, one of my talks is called Clutter Ain't Christian, um, tying it into the ministry area. But, you know, people say, I don't know where to get rid of it. Well, there's lots of sources. I know you have Vinnie's. You have, um, there's a, a Goodwill. I don't know if you have Goodwill. Uh, Salvation lots Army. Of, yeah, lots of op shops. Lots of op shops. Yeah. But even those, suppose you say they don't want my stuff. My children, one common thing I would often hear when I give my talks by seniors is, but my kids don't want it. My children don't want the stuff. You know, maybe they're minimalists these days and those kind of things. Uh, they, they don't want the China. I say, yeah. But did you read about that fire in the neighborhood, that family that lost everything? No, look at the last hurricane that came through or tornado that came through or maybe a tsunami that came. And those people now have nothing. They'd love your China. Boy, they would love to have those plates. They'd love to have those forks. So maybe your family can't use it, but you could give it away to a family who could use it. So when I hear lack of resources, I just wonder, are you really being creative? Okay. My wife was an my wife was an elementary teacher for 40 years. Trust me. She had lots of clutter. She wouldn't see it as clutter. She's not in the room right now, you know. All right? But there was a there's an agency near me called a uh, Scarce that takes all teachers used stuff. I mean, you know, teachers they they love at least her generation, they would love to make things for the kids, bulletin board things and, and other kinds of things for the kids or, or lots of packets on how to kids to do something. All right, now you're retired. What are you going to do with that? Nobody wants it. There are places like Scares where you bring it and they give it to teachers uh, for free. It's a nonprofit that gives it to other people. So there are ways to refurbish, uh, reuse your items. Last one, and I know you have a pressing question, but let me just, since I'm on a roll, is lack of ability. People say, I just don't know how to get rid of it and how to go do that. And that's why I think these decluttering coaches from ICD, go to the website, they're international, you can find them. There's also NAPO, although I don't know them as well, the National Association of Professional Organizers. They really are not declutterers, but they help you organize. NAPO and ICD excuse me, ICD are your two good resources. They will help you. Uh, lack of ability. I, I, I don't know how to do this. Well, you start small. No one says you have to go through everything. You know, you go through one box, maybe while you're watching TV, empty the box, go through that. Try one corner and one set of piles. Um, no one says you've got to get rid of everything there. Organize it. You might find I can keep a few of them, you know, and not all of them. So um, lack of ability. Uh, that answer to me is you find people, people that are willing to help you, family, friends. There are people that are willing, to, as long as they do it in a loving, caring, uh, compassionate way. You know, I don't want, I don't want a kid to come in and say, mom, you don't need this anymore and just throw it away without understanding mom. Oh, and flip side of that, and then I'll shut up, is um, it's, it's a gift. What, what seniors may not always realize is uh, because they're overwhelmed. You've lived in your house for 40, 50, 60 years, and you've got all this stuff, all right? I, it's too much to give. Yeah, but what a gift you're giving your children by decluttering. Because once you're, we're all going to die, once you're gone, okay, your kids are going to have to do that. And if you can put a serious dent into that pile, those piles, really help them, you'll have that much less for them that might be emotional triggers that you can help them go through. So there are ways that you can do it. So it's a gift to your children, all right, that if you can declutter um, for them. My parents did that. They, they started giving things as they downsized. They would give to us. My wife has a really cool thing she does for the Christmas holiday. She'll buy our kids something new and then something gently used in the house that matches it. It's a way of getting rid of it. And every time they have to come over, they got to bring something back to their house uh, from their room or something like that. You know, small, a little bit. Just get into that groove. Okay. Hope that helped.
Yeah. Um, I love the suggestion of, I mean, this is certainly something that is in my life is, you know, my parents, I, I've moved out of home now and my parents are like, take your stuff. And I'm like, I don't want to take all of my stuff now. If I just take one thing at a time, I can, you know, go through that one thing at a time and decide what to do with it. Um, whether I want to keep it or donate it or throw it away. Right. Um, and then we don't, then we don't have to, you know, deal with it all at once, I guess. That's right. And, um, it, is, yeah. and, and it is a way uh, your parents are really gifting you, pardon the pun, but they're really gifting you because, got, you know, sad to say when they pass, um, you, you and your, if you're the siblings will not have to squabble about it, things or have to worry about doing these things. And, oh my God, we have to empty the house. Mom's gone now. You know, that kind of stuff by, by downsizing and getting rid of these things ahead of time, you seniors, parents really give you a gift. Uh, I don't know what else to say about that. Mm. It's, it's a loving gesture for the future. But people are often scared to do that. I've heard people say, oh, that means I'm going to die. You want me to die? No, I'm not saying that. You know, people misperceive a lot of these things. Um, so um, what are your suggestions to tackle the lack of time when you have clutter or when you want to get rid of your clutter? I would say you do things a little bit at a time. You don't need to sit mm. there and, and do tons, you know. Uh, a body in motion stays in motion. It's a law of physics. So if you um, can start tackling one box at a time, one corner at a time, one pile at a time, that's great. And then reward yourself for doing that. Great. I did that. Good. Now I can watch Netflix for half an hour. Or um, great, now I have a, a scoop of ice cream, two scoops of ice cream instead of one because I went through that. So you reward yourself when you uh, reach your goals. Ah, and speaking of that, okay, look, I want your listeners, I want your viewers to understand. There's a famous thing we say in psychology, the 85% rule. What does that mean? That means if you reach 85% of your goal, that's a success. That's a win. Notice I didn't say 100% because nobody's perfect. So if you go through that pile and you don't get it all done, but you get 85%, that's the vast majority. That's not mediocre. That's not half. That's most. If you can get 85% done, that's a success. But we have this notion in our culture, and I'm going to get off the topic a little bit here, but good for your listeners to hear, that we have to be perfect. That, you know, I got to do it 100%. It's either all or nothing. No, no. Who said that? None of us are perfect. All right. Of course not. In fact, another psychology study has shown that you want 15% failure in life. That actually 100% success is not the best adjusted. It's 85-15 again. What do I mean? In other words, the best, the healthy, the healthiest individual, mentally healthy, the best adjusted is the person who has had failure in your life and has grown through it and gone through it. I, we call them Native Americans. I know, you know what I'm talking about. People from the United States who were here before the people moved in. The Native Americans say that the white man has it wrong. The white man wants clear water to walk through in life, wants life to be easy and to walk through clear. The Native American says, no, you want muddy water. Why muddy water? Why, Gabriella, do you think they would recommend walk through muddy water? Because you know what? someone else has been what? there? Well, say it again. Because you know someone else has been there before? No, not, not necessarily, no. If you walk, okay, think about walking through a clear water and look at, think of the effort walking through muddy water. Which one takes more effort? I guess the muddy water. Yes. And that's why you need that. That's what they're saying, because that's how mm. you're going to grow by putting mm. more, the more energy and the thing, the clearness light. When life is easy for you, uh, you know, you, you don't grow, you don't gain. Yeah, you have anything. no challenges. That's right. You want mm. a little bit of that. So that's a beautiful mm. metaphor. I love that expression mm. that they use. Yeah. Right. So don't look for perfection. Don't worry about getting the whole pile. Going back to that, all, the whole pile done. If you can get it all done, fantastic. But if you can get 85% of it done, Yahoo. That's great. That's a good, that's, I feel like that takes a lot of pressure off people um, to, to get started. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah nobody's perfect and you're not going to be perfect. In fact, uh, I just taught this in my class last night. People uh, don't like perfect people. We want competent people. We don't, we're not attracted to incompetent. We're attracted to competent. We're also not attracted to perfect. Now you might think, really? What? I, no, because perfect people make us look imperfect. And we wonder about them. What do you mean they're perfect? You mean they never fart? They never uh, burp? They never, uh, nobody's perfect. Okay. They never make a mistake. Uh, you know, so we want people that are good at what they do. And when you're good at what you do, you are going to mess up sometimes. You are going to fail. But that's okay. That's how you grow. Yeah, that's great. Um, I did want to sort of look at the one at like more into your studies um, and like the relationship between like well being, home, and clutter. Yeah. So some of the things we've shown, the first major study that Rostra and I did was called the dark side of home. And we found that the more clutter that people have, the lower their life satisfaction and the lower their sense of home. So here we live in this culture, this, this um, thing that we're told own and have and, uh, you know, buy, buy, buy more, more, more. And it's actually making us less satisfied with life. Life satisfaction goes down. Um, so that's it. You know, the Hindu monk spends seven years getting rid of everything he owns. All he needs to keep is two uh, gowns, two um, robes. Robes. Thank you. Had a word freeze there. Two robes, two bowls, and two spoons. It's all that they need to have. I tell people, imagine going on a cruise and that's all you can bring. <laughs> Okay. No, because people bring so much. All right. Get, you know, you don't need all that stuff. That's right. So spend time decluttering uh, to make your life happier. Um, again, I'm not saying don't own anything. It's the overabundance. It's that tipping point when you have too much. That's the problem. Do you know, so do you know why well-being goes down as you have more clutter? I think it's the stress. What are you going to do with all this? And, you know, one study, we didn't do this a long time ago, found that Americans or not American people, people spend up to three hours a week finding things arm's length away on their desk. That's a lot of lost time. You know, where's that paper? Where's that document? I know I put those keys somewhere. Oh, no, 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 no. Right? They spend three hours a week looking for something because it's disorganized. That's stressful. Why put yourself into that, that, that scenario, that place where you have to be stressed because you, you're not organized, you know? Um, be efficient. Be organized. I'm not saying be so tight and so rigid that, you know, you, no, that's, no one's telling you to be rigid. We are saying to be more organized. Put things back in the same place. You know, any parent knows that's a lesson you teach your kids over and over. Did you find it there? Put it back there. You know, uh, and uh, there's a reason for that, because when you go to look for it is there, you know, it's there. And if people just got into those habits more, I think um, that. So I, why I think it's because I think it's stressful looking for all the items that you have uh, among the piles that you can't find things. I, ha I have a question and this is a slightly off topic, maybe. So uh, my partner, um, I, he keeps losing his keys because he doesn't have anywhere in the house that he keeps his keys. Now I know where I keep my keys, so I never lose my keys, but he can't constantly lost his keys. So I got him one of those tiles that rings. Yeah. But I heard something- Do you think something... that's good or bad? Oh, I, I'm even more low tech. First, first of all, about the tiles. I'm not sure your listeners may and viewers may know better. I thought there was some technology problem with that. Um, oh, I thought I heard something months ago that, uh, um, um, they weren't helping you find things. They were helping robbers, people. For th there was some negative impact with the tiles. All right. But I, anyway, I would 100% believe that, honestly. Yeah. So, but what I'm going to say is go even more low tech. Okay. My wife's not here, so I can say this. Okay. She has clutter and, and stuff and I have clutter too, but I got my family into the habit right behind the door. We hang our keys. 
In fact, we have a Tasmania a piece of wood that I bought from Tasmania. We were talking about Tasmania because I love Tas. Um, and on that is all these hooks. So we keep we don't lose our keys. Our keys are always there. So I would tell you for you and your partner, take a nice trip. The next trip you have, buy yourself a nice souvenir thing that you can hang on the wall. That looks, and I'm thinking now, each of my kids have done something. They've gone on vacations and they've bought, oh, something from the Greek islands that holds their keys. Uh, because it's it's efficient. You won't lose your keys that way if you're more organized that way. And just get into that habit. You just keep putting it there. No, don't put it on the counter. Put it over there. And it's right by the door as soon as you come in. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that does. Mm. And then um, it's sentimental. You've got value to it by, because you mm -hmm. bought it together. Okay. Um, what else can I tell you? We've talked about how to tackle. We've talked mm -hmm. about its impact on well-being. Mm -hmm. um, I've mentioned how um, what what is clutter. Mm -hmm. But I, this is your show. I'm I'm talking. Yeah. <laughs> what about some misconceptions about clutter? I don't. That's a good question. I don't know if there are misconceptions. What? For example, why don't you give me an example? What do you mean? Some I don't know. So, um, yeah. I guess just um, oh, I think we've sort of almost talked about this. You know, a misconception is that we don't have enough time to tackle clutter, or uh, um, so, oh, myths, myths that people yeah. have. Yeah, the myth that I lack the time, or I lack the ability, or I don't made, don't know what to do with it. Those are all myths. Those are all solvable, mm. um, and yeah. I think all of those are things that people can can address. Um, yeah. You know, Gandhi said, there's not enough for everyone. How did he put this? There's not enough for everyone's greed, but there's enough for everyone's need. See, the problem is people have too much and some people have too little. And my point is, you don't really need all of that. You don't need three yachts. You don't need eight cars. Do you really need to have five homes? You know, so I think th th so much of the same thing. Do you really need the latest iPhone? All right. Can you live life with these other kinds of things? Do you really need these things? And the problem is we've taken wants and people have convinced us that it's a need. Oh, you got to have. And if you don't have, oh, you're behind, you're, you're losing out. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that all advances are wrong. I'm mean, not at all. It's like advances are helpful. But just be sensitive to the fact, is it too much? Do you have too much of the items? Do you really need all of that? Is it making you happy? You know, and I'm not sure it always is. Um, when we think about people who don't have things in the world, you know, when the pandemic happened here, this was interesting. It was shocking to me. I live in the outside of the city of Chicago, but in the city of Chicago, uh, when the pandemic ha happened and everybody had to stay home, kids had to stay home from school, right? The, the news reporters were saying, but 15% of the residents in the Chicago don't have computer access. And I'm like, 15% in the year 2020, in 2021, there's still people that have computer access? And the answer is, yeah, mm. we can we can solve that problem. There's no reason why we can't solve that issue. As community psychologists, these are the issues we look at. We look at what are the strengths in the community and how do we make it better, right? There's there's already internet access. How do we stretch this out to make give it to more people? So we don't need personally, or life's not about me. Life is about we. It's about all of us. And so the question is, how, why do I need all this stuff when I can help other people's lives get better? Mm. So there's actually a nonprofit agency that my students and I partnered with take, that takes old computer software, and we were talking about e-waste before, refurbishes it and gives it away to kids who don't have any laptops or any or schools that don't have these resources. That's fa fabulous. That's fantastic. That's great. We should be doing more things like that. Mm. Okay. I feel like there's not um, much left to say anymore. I've yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You have, so I we think. can end early, can't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I do have, so did you want to talk about your book, Still Procrastinating? Sure. I've, um, 
So one of my first areas of research, going back to 1988 when I was in graduate school, was the study of procrastination. Back in 88, in my doctoral dissertation in 89, there was practically nothing on the topic. Um, I'll save the story of how I got into this topic, perhaps for a future podcast, should you invite me back. But uh, just there's something for you who are viewers and listeners, perhaps you're in graduate school. Uh, there's a there's a concept uh, and you're looking for research projects to do. Right. Um, your mentors might tell you that there's one of two ways. This is what I was told. There's two ways you can go on research. You can do something that everybody else does or you can go into an area that's new that no one else has done. Now, the advantage of following what everybody else does is you have a body of research you can add to, but then you're lost in the crowd. When you're doing something new, your name becomes synonymous and you become uh, the leading and everything you explore in that area is new. The problem is you don't have much to fall back on. And so I, I liked that concept of, of everything I would explore. You know, they say your dissertation should carry you for 10 years of research, new ideas from the, that area. And so I just loved that idea. And so I started doing lots of research and I was the only one doing these things. And then from that in 93, 94, um, a famous psychologist who passed away, C.R. Snyder called me up. This was on the phone in those days and says, Joe, you've got to write the book on procrastination. There's no scholarly book and you've got to write the first one. So in 95, I've published the first book, Procrastination and Task Avoidance, and it's still the cornerstone book. Very hard to get. I know it's very expensive because it's out of print and all. But if you're going to research procrastination, you still need, even though it's 95, it's still the cornerstone book. Then in 90, 2000, did a special issue of a, of a journal that was pulled together into a book. Then in 2004, the American Psychological Association approached me and, and a co colleagues and said, we'd like you to write a book on how to counsel academic procrastination, because academic procrastination is different than regular procrastination. Again, I'll save that for another time. Um, and so I did that. And all the time while I'm doing all of these books, um, news reporters would call me and say, Ferrari, uh, this person just came out with a new book. And they say this and that about, Ferrari, about procrastination. What do you say? And I would go, no, the data doesn't sh support that. So in 2010, I finally caved and wrote a popular book. And the title is called Still Procrastinating because... Um, People were reading all these other books, and, and even now, people are still writing. Time, I'll just throw this nugget out there. Time management will not work for procrastination. It's a myth. You can't manage time. You manage yourself. And time management programs will not work with the chronic procrastinator. It's the least effective intervention. Okay? So all these books on this, and that's why my book says, Still Procrastinating? The No Regrets Guide. This is going to get you. So I reviewed all the literature that I had done and others done on the causes, the consequences, and everybody wants the cures. And that's the book. And uh, several podcasts have really helped to generate uh, interest in that book. And uh, even though it's 2010, uh, it's still timely in terms of what's in there. There have been some others in there. The people are now talking about procrastination, like it's a good thing. It's not a good thing. We'll talk more about Again, I don't want to give mm -hmm. it all away. But um, mm, yeah. No. Um, okay. So, mm. yeah. So th are there types of procrastinators that people like to ask? Uh, no, but um, I can talk about where I thought there was, and we did some research, uh, men and women procrastinate. There's no gender difference. But let's save all of the procrastination, if, mm. if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's we'll good, I think. Another time. But yeah. we'll give, hopefully we've given you, the listener, the viewer, um, interest. We sparked your interest. Yeah. In this yes. Topic. Maybe they can go out and buy the book and buy the um, book and I'll sign yeah. listener. I'll buy, I'll sign all the copies you buy, <laughs> find me, bring me to Australia and I'll sign all your copies. Okay, great. Um, so we'll go on to our next section, which is the open mic. This is, oh. um, a chance if you want to talk about anything that you're passionate about that, um, isn't necessarily related to the topic. Well, hmm. What am I passionate about? I love to travel. Um, mm -hmm. I love um, 
I love my, my, my life in ministry as a Catholic deacon. I walk with people in their, in their struggles. Um, I, I'm passionate about, there's a nonprofit agency in, located in Chicago, but in 27 U.S. cities that gives spiritual retreats, not religious retreats, for the homeless. It asks mm-hmm. homeless people, would you like to come away for the weekend and, you know, um, learn more about yourself? And your relationship with a higher power, and that I just, that is just so moving. Um, and as a deacon, I, I'm called to to serve, and that's one of the areas that I serve. I'm passionate about that. Passionate about um, getting people compassionate. I want to make compassionate caregivers in this world. I love teaching for that reason. I just told my students I teach on Monday evenings, and we're recording this on a Tuesday. And last night in class. Um, I, I, I told my students, you know, I, I, your generation is great. All right? My generation, I'm a boomer. I'm old. We tried to make change. We raised consciousness, but then we lost. We drifted. All right. Now the issues are still there. And your generation is compassionate, is passionate about making those changes. Great. Do it. I think we finally have a generation who will carry it. Um the generation before me were the hippies. I'm after them. They tried the revolution. They opened the door. My generation, we tried to carry it. We didn't uh, as far. And now the next generation needs to do that. So I'm passionate to make you guys make a change in the world. Um, make it better. You know, mm-hmm. m- most people don't have the opportunity. If you're listening to a podcast, you might be, you probably are a little more affluent. You probably have a little more resources that you could have the technology to do this. All right. And so that means you've been given a gift. You can call it God or you can call it something else. But uh, the, the higher force, if you're a Je- uh, the force, if you're a Jedi. But for something has made you this person to make a change in the world. And th- don't bury that that talent. Go ahead and make a difference. I don't know. That's Those are things I'm passionate about. Mm, that's amazing. <laughs> no, I mean, I still think we can make changes in the world. Um, mm. And I think we should. And we have to. And it's going to be hard. And do lots of forgiveness of each other. You know, um, people fumble. Um, my generation will try and will may say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing. I, I'm not excusing the, 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 the error that they made, but I am saying show grace, as we would say, as you would say today. We say forgiveness for the person who did these things. You don't have to forget, but you have to forgive. Um, and yeah, I think we need to do more of that. We need to, uh, okay. You asked me, so I'm just giving you ramble thoughts. Uh, I love the concept of Umbutu. Have you ever heard of that? No. It's a South African Swahili term. It means I am because we are. It means I'm a human being because we treat each other as human beings. My life is just as important as your life. And if I mistreat you, I'm mistreating me. So how can I come with an Uzi and just shoot you? How can I make you uh, famine? How can I invade your country? Because if I treat you like poop, I'm making myself like poop. Mbutu. It's all Mbutu, baby. You know, that's what life is. And I love that expression because it's all together. It goes back to what I said before. Life ain't about me. It's about we. We live in community, common unity, right? And we need to remember that more and, and not mistreat each other and not think so much about what can I get out of it? And my people get out of it. And my group get out of it. No, it ain't about you. It's about all of us. Mr. Spock said it well. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one. If you remember that classic line. Mm-hmm. Where the needs of others is what's more important than what I get out of it. So anyway, I'm passionate about those things. Yeah. But that comes from my ministry and community psych background. Mm. Um, and it does remind me a bit of with the whole um, vaccinations, um, mm. you know, vaccinating everyone because it benefits mm-hmm. everyone, but it but it also benefits us, you know, people ah, who here, have been vaccinated. One of my doc, one of my master students, are, has been looking at uh, re- reactants. Mm-hmm. All right, let me go. Let's get back on on psychology topic here. There's a concept called psychological reactants. Came up in the '60s, but uh, so prevalent with the whole mask and the vaccine thing. What reactance is, 
is to put it in very simple terms for the listener and the viewer is this concept of people are going to do something but once you tell them they have to do it they react against it from as a native new yorker you know i call it the oh yeah effect oh yeah just for that i'm not going to do it you know and in the 60s when this concept came up it had to do with cigarette smoking and when people were smoking around and they would say please don't smoke people would go oh yeah I was going to not smoke, but just because you told me I can't, I'm going to do it. All right. And so now we see the mask. Oh, yeah, you want me? To, you tell me I have to have a mask? Just for that, I'm not going to wear it. Okay. So there's a whole concept of psychological reactance that's going on. That is why please uh, posters are less effective than thank you posters. What do I mean? I mean, if you want people to do things, you don't say, please do this or that, or please don't do that. You'll get reactants. But if you say, thank you for not, thank you for doing this, people will comply. Why? Guilt. Oh, oh, oh okay. All right. I'll put the cigarette out. Oh, yeah. I better not. Okay. So, um, yeah. But so you make a good point about the, the whole COVID thing was the whole concept of reactants. I think there's a lot of psychological reactants that was going on and still going on with a lot of this stuff. Is that an interesting uh, concept to you? Yeah, that is. Um, it reminds me a bit of um, when you're in a shop and they and you have to wait, and they if they say, um, you know, thank you for waiting, you're like, oh, no worries. But it's like, um, please wait. You're like, oh, I don't want to wait. That type of thing. That's right. Um, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, um, Disney and, and a lot of amusement parks are good like that. Thank you for doing this or that. Um, oh, so if you want people to recycle, this was after the smoking in the 70s, the reactants work was on, you say, thank you for recycling. Thank you for putting your trash here. People are more likely to put a trash there than if you say, please deposit it here. So. Um, I'm going to quickly move into the practice area, um, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so this is, have you implemented anything from your research into your own life? I have over 400 publications. In what area <laughs> um, are you talking just, about with clutter? I mean, I think just, I mean, just pick one thing that maybe you do every day that you sort of have learned about and you've implemented into your life. Um, can be yeah, clutter, I'll, can be I anything to, else. I have to go back to my life as a clergyman. Um, one of the things that deacons do is they give sermons, um, just like priests and we call them homilies. And uh, I will tell my parishioners afterwards, my congregation, that it's, I use psychology principles all the time um, in that. So those are things that I've implemented from my research, from my knowledge, into my daily life. When I give a homily, uh, it, there's often, I don't say, here's a psychology principle. I just weave it in, uh, making the principle related to what that is. So that's one thing, but I don't know if that's pretty common to your listeners. Um, In terms I mean, of decluttering, I try to be more, or I've always been more organized. That's one of my strengths. Um, in terms of procrastination, you don't get over 480 publications if you procrastinate. So people know I'm not a procrastinator. Um, I get things done. Um, I wanted to understand why do people do that? I mean, life is too short. Why are you procrastinating? Get on with things. Do what you have to do and, and enjoy things. All right. um, anyway, okay. I don't okay, know if that uh, answers so your question, but go ahead. Uh, we've also got some questions from the audience. Good, um, let's do that. And then, yeah. So um, for uni students, um, how do you get out of the idea that you don't need all of the papers or all your textbooks um, for future reference? Yes. And this girl, not only does it work for uni students, it works for um, grandparents or parents who have to keep all the drawings that their kids ever made. You don't need all of those. I would say keep the ones that are most memorable. Now, if going to the uni person, that's for the parent, as well as for the uni student, um, if you think there's a prob possibility, a probability that you're going to be going to grad school, going on to another level, right, then you want to keep things that are relevant to that. So when I was in school, I kept all the undergraduate psychology textbooks I had because I never knew. You know, I didn't keep 
the bio. I didn't keep the English lit. I didn't keep the others, but I kept the ones that would somehow be relevant. And even now, I still have um, one book, the first book I ever used as a TA, because it was just a good reference. All right. So you, you, you know, through the years, you also declutter, you, um, um, you sort, uh, you, uh, there's a word, I can't think of the word right now. It's late at night over here, but you, you get rid of things. Um, you purge every now and then. So I would say purge what you can think about what you might need for the future. Keep some of those references and, um, get rid of the rest, you know, give away. Okay. Um, and how can you motivate yourself to begin, de- begin decluttering? Um, the, why not the decluttering group? Why don't you get three friends? You're in the age of social media listeners, viewers, post it. Hey, I'm going to go attack and take a picture of the pile. I'm going to take a, a, a tackle this pile today. Give me three days. Contact me in three days. That's called public posting. Another old ter- term that we found in the 60s before my time that, that works. When people publicly post things, they're more like, because now, now you're being held res- responsible for it. You're more likely to do things. So take a picture, post it, and have your friends in three days call you. Did you do it? Ah, what's the matter? You schlep, you lazy. Ah. No, because that social pressure will get you to do that. So that would be one thing I would recommend. Does that make mm. sense? Yes. Um, I don't like doing that because then I feel pressure. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So you'll go and you get the pile done. Exactly. That's yeah. Pretty, and that's um, what you want. Mm. Go ahead. Um, how, how do we detach ourselves emotionally from things that um, aren't important to us? You know, I say don't collect relics, have relationships. Instead of buying all those things that are emotionally, build the memories, build not the materials, the memories, build the experiences. That's what you want to do. You know, as you get older, you ask your kids, don't buy me stuff anymore. It's a very common thing. But uh, give mom and dad, give us a trip, give us a night out, give us a dinner, help us build a memory. Is That's going to be more important to me than another set of whatever that we may have, you know? So um, I would say to people, Try to build, don't worry about collecting stuff. Try to build a memory. Now, if you take this trip and this trip of 10, 12, 14 days is so memorable and there's something you could buy that helps you, then buy that one thing that helps you remember it. You don't need four things or 12 things. You know, buy the one thing that's going to do that. Um, If it makes you happy, buy it. Sure, why not? Just don't have to have a lot of it. And then what happens, um, how do you know if something is, um, has actual emotional value or, in, or you might just be using it as an emotional crutch? Mm. Like, how do you know the difference? Boy, that, that I can't answer. That has to be the person. Um, some people will say, I'm holding on to this because it might come back. Clothing is an example. I, I might, it might come back in style. You know, I had such a good time. Yeah, but the, the, the clothing you were wearing in 1985 will come back now, but it's going to look a little different because retailers aren't stupid. They're going to make it a little different, and you're going to look silly wearing the 1985 one. So holding on to it, even though it might come back, it's not going to come back the same. And so I would say to people, you know, don't hold on to it with the emotional connection that it's going to come back to. I don't know if this is directly answering the question, but it, it might be, you know, um, don't hold on to it thinking that maybe this will be helpful in the future. You don't know if it if it will help. Okay, I think that's all that we um, all that I had planned today. Uh, was there anything else that we missed that you wanted to talk about? No, no. The topic no? of clutter is uh, is done. <laughs> We've decluttered. Okay. We've decluttered great. the topic. Perfect. Well, thank you. It was uh, really great to speak to you today. Yes, and I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you for your yes. time. Um, and I look forward to uh, anybody wanting to follow up, follow up with me at, at DePaul University. Do you do you give email addresses or anything, or can I do that? Or? Um, I can pop your email address maybe in the like notes or something. Um, sure, do that. If yeah, anybody wants yeah. to contact me, they can do that. Um, and uh, same thing with the book if they want me to do something like that. All right.
Okay, great. You've been listening to Room by Room, produced by the Home Organization Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes like this from across 10 life management perspectives can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, and any other podcasting apps available on your smart devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating, sharing, and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people to find it so we can grow and continue to bring you quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website, ho.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Gabriella Yastra, and thanks for tuning in.